Thank you for joining for this episode of the Techspective podcast. Uh, my guest uh, is uh, Cenk Oz- Ozdemir. Um, Cenk, if you could uh, give a little bit of background on yourself uh, for, for the listeners. Hey, Tony, thanks for the invitation. Excited to be here. Uh, I'm Cenk Ozdemir. I lead the cloud and digital practice at Pricewaterhouse. Just to sum it up, it's our technology consulting business, and uh, excited to be here because it's it's what a great time in technology, given all the rotation that we're seeing in the market, uh, as well as the recent results of our cloud survey, kind of confirms that. So, okay, well, and and you know, so the, the reason that uh, you know I, I I had wanted to set this up actually was to talk about that survey i mean i think it's a there i I had a chance to take a look at it there's a lot of you know great information in there and and i think i I also find some value in having having a report like that or the insight the the insights that are in that report or from you that are kind of independent third party you know like i mean i I do a lot of talking you know with vendors um you know and and, you know who are actually you know, cloud cloud vendors, um, and I feel like, but you know, Price Waterhouse. Not that you don't operate in that in, in that space, but that Price Waterhouse is is, uh, you know, I I think it, it's a it, an established and respected name, you know, above and beyond, you know, just technology and cybersecurity. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Tony, the uh, we do these surveys. Uh, very frequently, uh, cloud is a is a clearly a hot topic for all of our clients. Um, it became a C-suite issue. When you look at our survey, you know there's going to be a few themes, right? When I if I were to summarize what came out of the survey, it was uh, many executives that we interviewed about over thousand executives. They said about seventy eight percent of their companies have adopted some version of the cloud or some level of adoption. But more than half have not realized the outcomes and the value out of the cloud. So that's one thing that came out, which is very consistent with what we're hearing in the market, which I'll get into in a few minutes. So that was the first thing. Adoption is going on at accelerated speed, but the value out of cloud is an issue. Second thing that came out is, you know, for those companies that are, you know, what we call cloud powered, um, meaning that they not only move to the cloud, but they have modernized their applications. So they're using all the innovation in the cloud that's provided by hyperscalers and third parties. And also they're writing cloud native applications. So what we see is that that group that has actually went beyond the migration is not only realizing twice as much value, but if you were to link their revenue growth, they seem to be higher performing companies. So that was the second thing that came out. And then the third thing that came out is uh, there is a clear characterization of what do the cloud powered companies do differently, right? And we found out about four things. One is they're committed to the cloud. So it's a cloud first approach to everything they do. Second thing, C-suite is fully involved in the cloud agenda. So, and the reason for that is we see this whole idea around business reinvention. Uh, I mean, pick an industry, pick a bank. If you're if you're a certain type of bank, if you want to get into new areas like consumer banking or you know anything around capital markets, if you're in the cloud, that gives you a lot faster acceleration. And then the other two things we found out is that uh, formal data analytics and AI strategy especially with all the news around generative AI that are coming out in the last few weeks, that whole idea around, you know, AI actually is an outcome, but the whole data supply chain behind it is really what powers it is becoming more and more prominent. And then the last thing we've seen is that, um, especially with our brand as PwC around trust and cyber and technology, what we're seeing is that Cloud is re, you know, reinvigorating the focus on trust and controls, right? It's one thing to go to the cloud, but it's the whole thing around because cloud is introducing new complexities, right? It's introducing and, and when you even think about it, most of our clients are on multiple clouds, one, two, three, four, five, 
um, you know, how do you sync up those clouds? How do you do right. multi-cloud operations? You know, we call it DevSecOps, right? Or DevSec CyberOps, right? So all of those things, what we're finding out is that the focus on trust and controls um, as well. Okay. All good insights. Um, and so I guess I would start by saying, you know, I feel like, you know, the cloud is just one 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 example of this. But uh, in my time, you know, we're, you know, in my decades working with technology, um, there's there's always this common theme of something is popular and you know or or it it, it kind of it gets mainstream acceptance and everyone kind of says okay you you need to do this thing you know all, all businesses should be doing this um but there's always like a spectrum of yes i'm just doing it or i actually understand why i'm doing it <laughs> and 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 everything in between and then and that even comes down to the 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 products you know, themselves that people use like you know like when i was when i was working in the trenches in cybersecurity um you know i would go, i would walk into an environment and you know maybe they had just suffered a, a, a an attack or a breach of some sort and the mentality in general was always sort of like okay well just tell me what what what, what do i need to buy to to fix that you know what, what what product can i can i put on the in, in the network that's going to make that not happen again and i would always say okay well hold on let's step back we need to understand like what have you got and are you using it fully like is it properly configured in the first place before you just start throwing money at things and that's kind of where i feel that you know a, a lot of organizations are with the cloud too like there's a general sense of if i'm a cio or you know, it's like I I need to be using the cloud. Um, you know, looking at the at, at the the report, you know, you 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 cited the number of the you know seventy eight percent, and you know when I looked at that, I thought, you know, I feel like it's not really optional anymore. Like you know, so I mean, and I've I felt that way for years. So I'm like, well, what's this twenty two percent? You know, what are, what are they doing? You know, like, but but even amongst the seventy eight percent, that's where this spectrum comes in. It's like, okay, well. You know, so you you subscribe to some clouds. You you've got Azure, you've got AWS, you've got Google Cloud, IBM Cloud, whatever clouds you're on, great. But do you even know why? <laughs> do, do you have do you have a goal for what for what? What's the purpose? Like like why why did you move to the cloud? And what do you hope to get out of it? And are you fully using? You know the 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 tools that are available to you and have things properly configured. From an operational perspective and from a security perspective. Yes. But you know, that that that's that's the big question. Well, well, Tony, you you asked a, a a very good question in a pretty simple format. And let me let me try to unpack this, right? So, and I want to talk about the cloud journey for your listeners to just simplify. Like what is what does it mean to go to the cloud, right? And let's look at the history of the cloud. Uh, in the last few years, okay? You know, when you look at the last wave of computing all the way from client server, you know, you know, all the companies building data centers or leasing data centers, that whole on-premise wave, right? Now, hyperscalers, I mean, you know the history of how the whole thing came about. With the capabilities around storage, compute, um, and, and, and the high amount of flexibility that cloud provides, what the, the way we call the phase one of the cloud was cloud 1.0, which is it started as a infrastructure cost arbitration alongside with high amount of flexibility, scalability. You know, in, in, in some environments, it takes eight, nine months to go procure servers, put them in your data center, set them up. You know, right now you can pull up a corporate credit card and spin up a server in an hour or two hours. So that kind of speed and flexibility started what we call the cloud 1.0. So the cloud 1.0 was moving your data and applications to the cloud, basically running them in the cloud on a cloud provider's architecture. And in some cases, a lot of our clients have not touched that data 
or the the uh, let's say the applications running in containers, right? So one that started with that cost and flexibility arbitrage, okay? Right. And in fact, there is a lot of companies out there that have, in a very fast pace, moved to the cloud, right? And then they sit there and say, "Well, I'm not getting any value out of it." Well, there's a simple reason for that. Uh, one is if you're running your current applications on a on a on a faster architecture, it's still the same applications. It's the same process model. It's the same data model. It's the same you know technology model, right? So you basically gain that infrastructure flexibility, but your end users and your results haven't changed. Second thing is a lot of our clients, when they move to the cloud, the business case sometimes was there, sometimes wasn't there. Meaning, moving to the cloud initially is going to be more expensive. I think everybody knows that. And it's not even the written cost of you know, getting out of a data center, maybe canceling a lease or, you know, you know, getting rid of your servers and hardware and but there is all kinds of other costs such as you have to train your own new, you know, your own people in the new technology. It's a brand new technology. You have to think of all kinds of different costs of, you know, getting your organizational ready. So 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 that is what Cloud 1.0 did. It gained all those, you know, basically turned the CapEx spending into an OpEx gain those advantages it was built into our clients financials but now when they sit back and say well i'm not getting value so why is that our definition at pwc of, of a cloud journey is four steps okay the step one is you sit down business it and maybe external providers of, of csps and a consulting firm and you know in, in some kind of a combination you figure out which application should stay on premise because there is business cases for keeping applications on premise. Which ones should go to what type of cloud? Should it go to a public cloud? Should it go to a private cloud? Should it go to edge? Or should it be public plus edge? That whole strategizing exercise, because that infrastructure wave came in so fast, wasn't always there. Okay, so the step one is strategy, cloud strategy. Step two is migration. Again, you figure out where you're gonna, what you're going to move, where you're going to move them to, then you move them in step two. And step three is what we call modernization, okay? The simplest way we define modernization is, let's say you have an application running today, you moved it to the cloud, and when you look at the hyperscalers, all of them have what we call microservices, okay? Some of them are technical, some of them are functional, Let's say you have a supply chain application you're running today. A hyperscaler has a microservice for IoT. Okay? Let's say you have a supply chain, you have 1,000 trucks running around the world or US. You're going to enable each one of them with, with geo data. You're going to put a GPS on all of them. You're going to put a bunch of sensors in it. Well, if you're not doing that today in your current application, now cloud gives you that opportunity of tying that function to a service. So that's what we call modernization. You take the existing data or exit application and start using what cloud providers give you. And frankly, uh, all of these are great engineering companies. They have thousands of engineers that built those capabilities. It's a great way of accessing what we call packaged innovation that's already there. So that's modernization. And then the last step of the cloud is what we call cloud native development, which is custom development, okay? And what is that about? What that's about is that in many industries, many companies have 20, 30 year old applications that were written in, you know, let's call it third generation languages, right? And when those applications have to be rewritten, what's going to happen is they're going to be rewritten as cloud-friendly, cloud-native technologies. It doesn't mean that it's going to be a native hyperscaler, but it could be any four-generation language. And in fact, in some cases, our clients are calculating mobility between different cloud providers. So, so Tony, I think the, the issue is here's what happened, in our opinion. Instead of going strategy, migration, modernization, cloud native, maybe you can combine the last two in parallel. A lot of our clients start with step two, 
Oh, value is not there. Now back to step one, do the strategy. And then doing what's called an app rationalization. Let's look at all the reps. Let's modernize them as fast as we can in a cost-effective manner. And then the last thing that everybody's doing is business model reinvention. This is the whole idea around, can I do a combination of cloud native development and modernization to create new business opportunities for my company or reinvent new ways and, and new channels for myself? So that's the reason why we see that, you know, Hey, we're going to the cloud. Everyone's going to the cloud, but now suddenly I'm not getting value. Let me go back to the strategy or refresh the strategy so that now I can get to the next level. So that that's kind of right. that's kind of the journey we see from a you know hundred thousand foot level. Well, and I you know, I think um you know to kind of talk about the your 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 phase one or whatever, the kind of the the cloud 1.0, you know, yeah, it's like you know, again, you know, someone says, okay, well, uh, you know, I, I, my, my company's not in the cloud. I need to go to the cloud. So you sign up for Azure or AWS and you move stuff and, and like, you know, to, to the point you already made, what you're moving is the applications and data that you were already running in your data center. You're just moving them from point A to point B and now you're just running it from the cloud instead of running it in the data center. Nothing really changed. You, you know, you've, you've changed the infrastructure, but you're still doing everything the same. Um, there has to be that kind of maturation or evolution of thought of saying, okay, but you know, let, let's re-envision this. Like how, instead of just saying, okay, let's, I'm gonna take the way I've always done things and now I'm just gonna do it from the cloud, like work backwards from there and say, okay, what could I do in the cloud? And how do I get from here to there? Like, you know, how, how do I, how do I, you know, shift the the, the applications that I'm doing? And, you know, and, and you, know, you made the point as well that, once you make that transition, once you're once you're in the cloud, you actually have access to you know different data, different metrics, different ways of doing things, and you know, and if you if you know what to look at and you're and you're looking at it the right way, you open a lot of doors. Um, it's just again kind of that change in mindset from am I just moving stuff that I was already doing and, and now I'm doing it from the cloud or am I actually looking at this strategically as like what can I accomplish with the cloud? Hundred percent. Like you, you summed it well. I think the, uh, I mean, the good news is that, you know, that infrastructure move. I mean, I have a T-shirt in the back somewhere that says "Cloud." There's no cloud. It's just somebody else's computer. Right. Just to joke with it. But the the thing is that even that cloud 1.0 for the companies that understand the capability is is a huge step, right? Even being able to run that, you know, you know, simple example, scalability, right? You know, you were running something and, you know, that's one. Second thing, you know, cyber, you know, uh, the cyber capabilities offered by, you know, hyperscalers, you know, those kind of benefits, you're, you're, you're instantly tapping into capacity, flexibility, uh, some level of trust. Uh, so that that's there. The, the thing is that, the cloud, you know, moving to the cloud is not cheap. So driving that business value, okay? And one of the interesting things that came out of the survey is that, you know, that that driving business value thing you talked about, right? For quite a bit of time, the CIO role, right? And the CTO role in the last, let's call it the last 10, 15 years, have suddenly started becoming like a little bit of a mill office, back office kind of a role you know, run and keep the lights on. One of the things in the survey that we saw is that the CIO, CTO type of role is coming back as a strategic role, okay? Mm -hmm. And and frankly, in, in my role, I, I interact with a lot of C-suite members, especially on the tech side. Everybody is now, uh, you know, because of that power that you get from the cloud, that the package innovation and all the capability, the CIOs are becoming a strategic partner to everyone else in the C-suite. And that's one of the right. things you've seen that, you know, there is a much higher level of collaboration that the cloud is driving, right? And then, you know, and then th there's some other exciting things going on. I mean, we're, uh, for a lot of our clients, 
we're successfully combining these technologies. So can I use like, for example, if you're whatever, if you have a, if you're in supply chain, you got trucks and you got, you know, trains and can I use like geo data? Can I use drones? Can I use camera input? Can I use AI, functional AI? And then recently we started thinking through, like I get all that data and sensors, bring them all into that, you know, cloud computing, high, high computing power level. And then now I can add generative AI on top of it. So these kind of combined capabilities, frankly, it is extremely hard uh, for our clients to implement if they don't get on the cloud, because now they have to figure out all those competencies. Yeah. They have to figure out IoT. They have to figure out streaming. They have to figure out sensing. They have to figure out tech scaling. All that stuff is now coming in as, hey, you know, it's already there. Tap into it, enable it. So that's that's really yeah. a, a, an amazing thing that's happening right now. Yeah, well, so a couple of things. You know, so first, when you, you said, you know, moving to the cloud is not cheap. Um, I was going to say, yeah, part of that goes back to that. The It comes back to that concept of I'm just going to take what I'm doing. I'm going to move it over here because you move it over there. But because your cloud access is built differently, you know, like you know, it was just running in your data center, didn't matter. You can do whatever you want. Data flows back and forth. You don't care. Um, all of a sudden, now you're getting billed on the volume of traffic one way or the other and, 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 the, and the transactions that are happening. And you know, it makes you want to go back and rethink like, okay, wait a minute, do I really, you know, am, am I doing this the right way? There's there, maybe there's a more efficient way for me to do this to bring that cloud cost down. That's one one aspect. The other thing I was going to say is when you're talked about the kind of the shift in where the CIO, CTO role sits, yeah, I feel like, I feel like that also kind of fits with on the one hand, you know, is like is just, you know, this initial, hey, we're going to the cloud. You know, I, I you know, it, it, yeah, you're you're the CIO, you're the CTO, but I just need you to kind of, you know, just just run this cloud thing. The evolution, in my opinion, of now where it's become a more strategic thing and, and CIOs are, are a much more valued role in a lot of organizations is part of that the the maturation and the evolution of of realizing oh wait there's a whole bunch more we could be tapping into here like this isn't just a i just need you to manage our cloud subscriptions this is i need someone with a vision <laughs> for how to how to how to really do this and all of a sudden you're you're instead of just being someone who just manages the aws subscription you know now you're back in the c suite you know planning and strategizing 100% i mean look the cios you know You'll see in the survey, they're talking to the CISO, they're talking to the CDO, they're talking to the COO, talking to the board. Uh, th that's absolutely the case. And, and one other thing, Tony, that's happening is that, I mean, clearly in the current economic, geopolitical and business environment, there's a lot of cost consciousness, if you will. You know, everybody's looking at different costs. But one of the other things that we're seeing in the market is that as much as companies are cost conscious and they want to cut, you know, extraneous, extraneous cost, some of that cut costs are coming back into the cloud transformation as an innovation and growth investment. So that is one of the interesting things uh, that we're seeing. I mean, I'm not an economist. I wouldn't want to comment on economy and all that stuff, but the, the, the one thing that I see, having been in this business for 30 years and going through multiple cycles up and down, one interesting thing about this current cycle is that 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 money that's saved or, you know, identified is coming back into the company and back into the innovation stream to create this this next next gen business models. It's a very. Uh, very interesting thing to see and, and frankly it's it's pretty exciting okay yeah well it to hit on the 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 kind of the final point you made about you know the different things you can just kind of turn on you know i mean i've had a number of conversations with microsoft in particular about you know the, the, you know they've they've gone very heavy on on iot on, on the azure side to try to you know make it into like you know like kind of the iot platform um 
you know, they're doing interesting stuff with Azure Space. You know, the, the, you know I've had conversations with them where they're, you know, the, 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 the investments they're making there. And one of the things that that has always kind of stood out to me is the kind of democratizing aspect of it. That 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 because these things now exist as I can just flip a switch on my cloud subscription and turn these things off and on. Um, it levels the playing field some for smaller companies. Like I don't have to have, you know, a massive engineering team. I don't need to be a Fortune 100 enterprise, you know, to, in order to have these capabilities and features available to me. I can just flip them on, and and you know, be playing in the same field as as the as the larger enterprises. Um, you're hundred percent right. I mean, this. I mean, again, this is what's exciting about this, right? You, because you know, when you look at all hyperscalers out there have a page, you can go in there and you see the microservices. It used to be purely technical, you know, scaling and that. Now you see a lot more functional. Like you can do video streaming. If you want to open up a next video streaming platform yourself as a startup, you don't have to worry about that backend technology and try to write it and engineer it. So you're absolutely right. It's democratized. But one thing, Tony, that's uh, that's really important, which is there is also a big movement of what we call the industry clouds. Okay. And, and this is something that not necessarily in the survey, because the context is different, but what you're going to see as an evolution of cloud 2.0, okay? Cloud 2.0 and maybe 2.5, I would say, is you're going to see that companies, when they go to the cloud, after a certain time in the cloud, meaning you modernize your applications, you're writing, they're going to demand industry features, okay? And this could be many different things in many industries, right? But when you look at, again, I call it the last computing cycle where ERP and SaaS went. Right. The ERPs were transactional systems, right? You know, they enabled functions, they enabled finance, they enabled supply chain, they enabled HR, they enabled, uh, you know, front office with customer. But then after a while, the, the, uh, the company is demanded, it says, okay, well, I'm doing this, but I'm a telco and I have a different, you know, customer service and billing need than somebody maybe in industrial products. So where is my industry specifics? How will you right, enable right. it for me so I don't have to build it custom myself? So that whole idea of, you know, the industry specifics, we anticipate that to come into the cloud play because at some point our clients are going to say, okay, so we moved out of the data centers. We all that all, did all of that. And now if I'm in the cloud, is there something that my industry can use out of the box? So, you know, PwC is building industry clouds, basically reference architectures so that our clients won't have to. Um, hyperscalers are working on it. Third party. Uh, tech companies are working on it, but this is this is one thing that you're going to see. Uh, that's going to be the next discussion, right? In a cloud, 1.0 was migration. 2.0 is, you know, modernization, reinvention, you know, and then right in the coattails of that, everybody's going to start thinking about like, I don't want to build all this stuff custom. Right? Can you provide it to me? So. So that's that's something to watch in terms of the the, the continuum of the evolution. Okay, well, so I wanted to talk about there's a, there's a part, you know, sort of towards the beginning ish of the of the report where it says you know cloud powered companies are four times more likely to say they face no barriers to achieving cloud transformation value in the following areas and then you know, there's a list of things and it's things like improved decision making, increased productivity, increased agility faster time to market, et cetera, et cetera, right? And, you know, as I would expect, 
uh, you know, cloud powered companies are way over here saying, yeah, we got this. And not in cloud, but non cloud powered companies are saying, yeah, yeah, we kind of struggle with that. That part makes sense. For years now, the industry and, and I specifically have, you know, talked about these things exactly as like, this is the competitive advantage, you know, like, like, yes, you have to, you have to adopt the cloud, you have to do these things so you can have this better decision making, faster time to market, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what I haven't really seen, and and I and I, I should, you know, I can go do this research and try try and find this, but like, is what's the reality of how that's played out over time? You know, like I, you know, what I talk about it theoretically as you know, it, it is a competitive advantage, but it's like what I want is now to go back, say, five years from now to these same companies who said, yeah, you know, we're we're crushing it because we we're in the cloud, and say, okay, well, where are you? Did you crush it? Yeah. Well, I mean, you're. Uh, this is a, this is a, this is a big question. Um, I mean, to to answer your question, let's go back to the pandemic for a moment, right? When pandemic came along, I mean, nobody knew what to do, right? In the beginning of it, from a business standpoint, as a consumer, as a, let's say, a company that provides services to that consumer, I can clearly tell you, if you were on the cloud, okay, uh, you were able to build your new channels, Okay, whatever you let's say let's say consumer as a simple example, you know, you used to sell to your distributors. If you were on the cloud, you were able to create a direct to consumer channel faster than anybody else. And we've seen and we helped hundreds of our clients to get there because we didn't have to worry about that migration. We didn't have to worry about that technical debt. They were already there. Right. Well, it kind of comes back to what we we're saying, like whether whether it's turning on and off microservices or simply scaling, building out, like once you already have like that established footprint in the cloud, it's a lot easier to turn left, turn right, scale up, scale down. You know, you, you can you, you, you have that agility. 100 percent. So that that's I mean, look, there's no magic to. Um, you know, if you're on the cloud and it's, if you're progressive around using that innovation, there's no magic to that because you're you're helping your top line, you're helping your bottom line. Okay, you're also able to build user interfaces. You know, today is a new consumer, new business to business expectations. So, I mean, it's look. My theory is that probably about five years from today, we're not going to talk about any of these things. We're going to talk about new sets of technologies. But but right now, I think uh, the the challenge is, again, I mean, when you think of a typical IT department, uh, you're not typically designed to go unleash that prepackaged innovation that easily. It used to come to you from an ERP right. provider or a SaaS provider, but now this is a bit. I mean, Tony, this is a little bit like a Lego blocks. You can create so much value out of a base set of capabilities. You know what I'm saying? And, yeah. and the other thing that you're seeing is that, you know, you got to pay also attention to the what happened to the ERPs. ERPs used to be a monolithic, uh, massive computing power for all functions and for all industries. Over time, that ERP core has changed itself to a new digital core. Right. And even the ERP companies have now restructured themselves of the, having a smaller core but having a more nimble surrounding architecture around it with a bunch of SaaS, okay, and a bunch of custom, now cloud is going to more enable that because everybody's going to run on one, one type of cloud. Uh, so, so from that perspective, I think uh, you know, that's going to be the big thing. And, and the, the thing to watch for in everything we say here is it is very easy to create the complexity of the legacy in the cloud. If you're not careful and if you're not yeah. planned and if you're not strategized. In fact, that that complexity could be more challenging for an organization because it's new set of technologies. So 
what we recommend to our clients is that expect that complexity and plan for it. Plan the mitigation tech, you know, plan mitigations, plan training of your uh, people in the company on how to manage them. Tap into uh, technologies out there. Again, I mentioned this earlier in the podcast, uh, multi-cloud syncing, multi-cloud operations. You know, our anticipation is that everybody's going to be a multi-cloud environment. It already is. Now, right. When you include SaaS and ERP on cloud and everybody's going to be on one, two, three, four, five different clouds. So how do you build that in the best and most efficient, highest trust, best cyber defense type of an environment and architecture. Uh, and, and that's something that we're constantly thinking about. And, and, and all the companies should be looking at that very proactively. Um, I, I was thinking of, you know, when, when you talk about, you know, where we'll be five years from now or whatever, I was like, yeah, I wonder like, what, what you, do you think there will come a point where we just accept it as that's just infrastructure and stop even calling it something else. Like how long, how long do you have to do something before it becomes the legacy? Yeah, Tony, I think this one is different, right? Um, last computing wave, I mean, mainframe came along. There's a million technologies around mainframe and client server came along, million tech. A lot of that computing and infrastructure plays have not turned them into non-tech stuff. This one is a little different, okay? And I think that this is a, the, the last architecture came with technology innovation, okay? There were better middleware. There were better, you know, core compute. There were, this one not only comes with the technology innovation, you know, scalability, all that stuff, but it also comes with business innovation tools. Right. I think that's going to be the biggest difference. The biggest difference is going to be from a pure architecture standpoint. I don't think we're going to talk about the architecture. It's not going to be, hey, are you on the cloud or not? There won't be too many business cases of keeping your own data center unless it's a sovereign cloud right. kind of a thing. And I truly think there will be some business cases, but the majority of it, we're not going to talk about cloud. But what we're going to talk about is the different package innovations that come with it. So, so Tony, I mean, long answer to a simple question i think this one's different because of that business innovation business reinvention capability that's going to be there and i also see that consulting companies like price waterhouse and you know third parties and other companies are all developing like interesting new use cases in the cloud okay i mean let's look at the data space right data space has significant innovation going on right now. It's partially because most of the AI engines, I mean, we talk about AI so much, right? Hey, AI this, AI that. Well, a good portion of an AI output is the good old data work, right? What is it? It's, it's, it's data, you know, extraction, data harmonization, data right. uh, tagging, data classification, and machine teaching, right? So what you're going to see is that there's a lot of new things coming on in the market. There's new business models. Can we all get on the same cloud? Let's say we have five restaurants and we all get on the same cloud and now we start sharing data. Well, we're all competing, but certain parts of the data we share with each other. Why do we do that? Well, I pay for that data to somebody else today to get access to your, like industries are starting to like cluster around some of these concepts. There's more open-mindedness. Uh, so you're gonna see significant business innovation. That's my that's my thinking. We'll, we'll talk less about the infrastructure, but we'll talk more <clears throat> about the innovation side of this. Okay. Well, actually that's a, actually a pretty good segue to the other question that I, that I had, which is, you know, you, you have, you know, long-term established enterprises, they've got data centers, they've been doing things the way they're doing things. And then you've got greenfield startups just starting off in the cloud. And I was gonna you know, ask your thoughts on, you know, 
pros and cons of either or or do you know do do startups that that do startups that are born in the cloud have any sort of advantage in terms of they already understand it they're there it's it's totally native to them as opposed to trying to like turn the ship or you know are there you know just are there advantages to being the established company and and coming from that angle um very good question i'm thinking for a second because i want to go into a interesting direction with this so what is like when you look at born in the cloud Right. What is the feature of a born in the cloud company? What are the the core capabilities are kind of different, which goes back to the whole idea around engineering. I mean, we 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 don't talk about engineering enough. But when you read the news in detail, you're going to what you see is that a lot of the companies, I mean, I saw a few months back a bank is hiring 10,000 software engineers. So to me, I, I mean, look. The, the large companies have complex operations, probably, you know, it's hard to compare them to a startup, but I'll tell you, a, you know, I work with a lot of uh, people, you know, I'm a sponsor of some of the, you know, tech startups and I go to these events. What I see is that those companies know nothing else but cloud and their core competency is software engineering, in some cases, product engineering. Okay. So, so that gives them a quite bit of an edge, right? Again, I I don't want to put the a you know hundred billion dollar company in the same bucket as a, but what you see is that there's a lot of legacy technical debt in a larger company that will over time sunset, right? With the rise of the cloud technology, when you're in a born in the cloud company, you don't have that technical debt. You don't have this parallel or multi-speed situation, right? And you're really doubling down on your, you know, on the technology side, again, not the business side, but you're doubling down on your software engineering capabilities. Uh, so that, that's the huge benefit of being born in the cloud. You're, you're, you're singularly focused and you're very much of a, you know, engineering driven approach in, in most of the startups that, that I see today. Okay. Interesting. Um, all right. As you know, we have the uh, got a few minutes left. We're able to kind of kind of wind things down. I want to take a look at the report again and see if there's anything else that kind of stands out to me there. Um, I mean, I think one 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 thing that I I think kind of jumped out at me is because you don't you you r rarely see in a survey. A 100 percent. You know, there is, you see 90s, 95s, whatever. Um, but in this survey, you, in your report, you've got uh, you know 100 percent of cloud powered companies have improved decision making through cloud transformation. So it's a you know, it's an impressive number, and I think you know for for companies that aren't there, uh, you know, definitely something to to look at i mean you know i if if i had to boil down you know I've, I've done some some work with uh on the concept of decision intelligence and stuff and and I, and I feel like when you boil it down that's that that just is what business comes down to is, is effective decision making you know and and do you have do you have the right information you know, do you do you have all of the information you need to make the decision? How quickly can you get the right information so you can make the decision faster? Um, and and you know, those are the things that differentiate you from from the competitors. Is you know, did do you did you have the information to make the right decision? And were you able to make the right decision faster? And it seems from the survey that you know the 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 the, the individuals you talk to, you know, feel like you know, hundred percent of them feel like that you know, being in the cloud has given them that. 100%, but you know, maybe let me add a little flavor to that, right? The, the reason for that, Tony, is that we, we're seeing a lot of companies take a cloud-first approach. So they don't want to continue to invest in the legacy architectures and legacy processes. So that's why that that is there, right? To to stop, because, and the, and the reason is pretty simple. We also see a, I wouldn't call it everyone, but a, a, a surprising portion of our clients 
are really determined to take complexity out when they're moving to the cloud. What does that what does that mean? Sunsetting a lot of the applications. Don't move them to the cloud, sunset them. Right? So they're looking at rationalization. They're looking at data. They're looking at um, let's say um, I'm sure you know this. Almost all ERPs are upgrading right now. And the reason well, for that is not only a new version of the ERP, but that ERP is capable of running on the cloud. And what we're seeing is that while our clients are going to the cloud, their core business operations, especially the back office, they're trying to simplify it, meaning that they had tons of you know, custom objects and customizations in the current version. We're seeing them leave those behind, which is, I mean, I've been around for a long time in this business. I, I, this is this is a bit surprising to see very complicated companies leaving thousands of customizations and say, you know what, I'm going to fit the standard, leave customization behind, and I'm really going to focus on value-added stuff, which is my core competencies. You know what I'm saying? If I'm a supply right. chain company, I'm not going to worry about customizing finance. I'm going to really work on my optimization of my supply chain and global network and disaster recovery, all that. So, 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 Tony, that's why it's it's a two-step process. The, the the governance is built to reduce the complexity. The the governance is also built to, you know, simplify so that they can invest those dollars that's going into those complications today into more growth in more competitive areas. Okay. All right, very interesting. Um, I wanted to wrap up, and one of the one of the things I, I, I like to do often is just kind of sum up with, uh, you know, basically asking if you had any final thoughts or if there was a question you were hoping I would ask that I didn't ask. So, you know, if there was something in the report that you wanted me to hit on and you're like, damn it, Tony didn't ask that question. <laughs> um. <laughs> Look, it's uh, one area we didn't get into too much is trust and controls. Um, so that that's something that I think uh, everybody should be thinking about because, you know, with cloud, with cloud native, right? Again, we haven't seen this much of a, let's call it a rewrite custom development, you know, going from third generation to fourth generation languages, redo your applications. With that, there is a there should be a heightened discussion around trust and controls okay and especially in this heightened sensitivity of the world today is around cyber and everything else so that's one area i think uh uh we didn't we didn't spend too much time on but i mean to sum this up tony i think we're we're living in a very exciting moment again from a pure technologist's lens uh, you know, some people call this the the new industrial revolution. Um, this is a this is a this is the pinnacle moment where a lot of the companies out there are going to say, well, you know, how do I increase the longevity of my company? Because the, the the longevity of the companies are reducing. I mean, you can Google that, right? From fifty plus years to a lot less. So there is an interesting moment where things are being tech driven not only just tech enabled, but at the same time where there is an opportunity to do business reinvention. And, you know, this is a different cycle. And, you know, people like myself are super excited about it. Uh, but, you know, all the concepts we talked about, you know, have your strategy right from the front, stick to that strategy. The cloud journey is going to be a continuum. It's not like you get to step four and then you're done. It's going to continue for many years. Uh, but I'll tell you, the, the level of capabilities that are now available to companies, their customers, and then their end customers is, is immense. So super exciting. All right. Well, I want to uh, thank you for taking the time to join me. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. I appreciate you investing your time to listen to the podcast. 
but I also invite you to engage on social media. Uh, please go like our Facebook page and follow at Techspective on Twitter and Instagram. You can feel free to let me know what you like, let me know what you don't like, let me know if you love it, let me know if it sucks, and uh, let me know what products you'd like to see reviewed or what uh, questions that you'd like to see answered in future posts.